started, we have uh, Willie Summers. Willie is the uh, Invasive Plant Program Coordinator for the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management. In that role, he oversees the Invasive Plant Grant and provides resources and technical assistance to other state agencies, private landowners, and collaborative groups. He's an Arizona native with a master's degree from the University of Arizona in range management and a bachelor's degree from Arizona State University in environmental resources. So Willie, I'm gonna attempt to turn over presentation control to you, let you take it away. And uh, as a reminder, some of you already know this uh, from being on other sessions, all of these sessions are being recorded and should be available after the conference. It might not be until next week or so, but they all will be available. Great, thank you, Glenn, and uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us um, this afternoon. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and share my screen. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Great. Um, as Glenn mentioned, I'm with uh, Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management, and um, I've, I've been the Invasive Plant Program Coordinator um, for um, almost a year now. It'll be a year next month. Um, but the nice thing is that uh, when I took this position with the agency, um, I already had um, this Invasive Plant Treatment Prioritization Analysis um, conducted by um, folks in the agency um, to help us with um, some of our program delivery. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about um, this afternoon. So just a quick presentation overview um, about the invasive uh, plant program. Talk a little bit about that and we have a grant program as well. I'm going to talk about the purpose and intended users um, of this analysis. A little bit about the methodology, not going to go too far into that. Um, certainly going to talk about some of the results and applications that we've developed. And then a little bit about some potential next steps um, for uh, this tool, and then wrap up with a summary um, summary of, of what we've covered today. So a little bit about our invasive plant program. Um, this program is, is a forestry program under um, our Urban and Community Forestry, Forest Health, and Invasive Plants program. So they're the pro program manager that oversees um, these different facets. Um, what we do in the Invasive Plant program, which I oversee, is, is support cooperative management. You cannot manage invasive plants um, effectively without looking across land ownerships and looking at the whole problem. We focus on prevention detection and control of invasive plant infestations. And then we want to do revegetation with native plants so that um, there's a competitive advantage uh, shifted back to the native plants. We encourage the use of an integrated weed management approach for the best results. So that means using all the tools in the toolbox and um, the best strategy for that particular site. And this program is supported by the USDA Forest Service and funding from the state of Arizona. And then I've got a photo on the right of an invasive uh, grass called giant reed, um, which is a large bamboo-like grass, um, in this case growing in Marana. We have an invasive plant grant. Uh, we've had this grant since 2009 with federal funding, but um, last year there was a new state statute um, developed and the Non-Native Vegetation Species Eradication Fund was established that provides legislative appropriations to DSFM to provide grants. So last year, um, in our initial year, we were provided $2 million for um, invasive plant grant projects, and we funded 11 projects, and those have begun and are underway. This year um, and going forward through 2029, there's a million dollars of state money available for grants. Um, and we funded seven projects for this current grant cycle and those are um, gonna be developed um, over the next month. And the image on the right is uh, um, from the Arboretum at Flagstaff and they've got an invasive plants 
uh, ranger program um, there in Flagstaff to stop some of the invasive plants that are a challenge um, in that area. So talking about this invasive plant uh, treatment prioritization, um, there's a, a few purposes here that I want to go over. What we wanted to do was rapidly and strategically assess Arizona's invasive plants management data. So scour um, the state for information that we can combine and, and look at the state as a whole. Um, we want to use data to inform our priorities in planning for our programs, account for existing invasive plant management efforts from the local level to the state level to the federal level, so try to be comprehensive. We want to keep the spatial and quantitative analysis simple and transparent, which I certainly like, and generate summaries and geospatial products for not only our own sharing and use, but for the public as well. And, and we'll, we'll see some of those here shortly. But our intended users are, are it's pretty broad. Um, Arizona's communities, uh, public agencies, educational institutions like the universities, um, nonprofit organizations and private individuals. Um, so they're all intended to, to use this information. If you're a commercial entity and want to use this information, then um, there's a slightly different protocol um, for that, that use. So in terms of what we did, um, I'll show you some examples here in a minute, but um, the spatial analysis is based on one square mile hexagons. And that approach was taken, as I understand it, to uh, blur uh, land ownership boundaries. Um, and so we're not necessarily concerned about who owns what land and where, you know, where the invasive plants are, but just uh, the priorities and, and um, that, that allows for um, more of a, an unbiased look at, at land ownership. We have a total of eight sub-indices for criteria that were developed by an expert panel. Um, the panel included individuals from state agencies, um, federal agencies, and, and some NGOs um, that work um, carefully and closely on invasive plant management. For instance, the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum in Tucson. So these eight sub-indices were combined into uh, Invasive Plant Treatment Prioritization Master Index. Um, just a little bit more um, of the analysis at a high level. The, the master score that we use is that simply the average of all the sub-indices um, for that, you know, one square mile hexagon. So you basically divide, add up those, you know, um, eight indices and divide by eight. And then what we did is uh, create a master index, which is based on normalizing that master score for each hexagon. That's a little bit more um, detail, and uh, we, we won't go into that. Um, here, here this afternoon. So a little bit about these eight criteria that we use and some of the, the data sources. Um, the table here provides the criteria. So, and certainly in our world of, of uh, wildfire uh, management for DSFM, um, fire risk was uh, criteria one, and, and that came from our 2012 um, Easy Wrap Wildfire Risk Index. If you're not familiar with AZRAP, um, it's the Arizona Wildfire Risk Assessment Portal. And that's a tool we developed to help, kind of like this tool, help um, communities and, and agencies assess wildfire risk um, in their area. We looked at riparian areas, and so we had two big data sets, the, the FEMA flood zone, your flood zone, and then U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service riparian areas and, and wetlands. Um, that was all 2017 data. This this tool, this analysis was done largely in 2017 and 2018. Protected species, we wanted to look at um, sensitive wildlife species. So um, Arizona Game and Fish had a data set that we uh, analyzed and included in, in, in this tool for protected species observations over a, a period of time there. Um, spread corridors, so looking at roads and perennial rivers, um, the land department had a perennial river data set and the U.S. Census helped us with the road road layer and, and weeds spread along roads as, as many of you may know that work in natural resources, that's a major corridor. Invasive threat level, um, this was a little bit more involved, but um, invasive plant observations ranked. There are multiple sources um, that we looked at. 
um, in Arizona to gauge um, where invasive plants are and, and, and the threat. We also wanted to consider prior treatments by different agencies and organizations, so we compiled uh, treatment areas um, and polygons reported um, over that two-year span from several different sources. We also wanted to look at the wildland urban interface classification, um, and we got some data from um, Silvis, which I, is a lab at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, they have some good data um, for various states across the West. Um, so those are areas that are built environments close to wildlands where, where fire risk is often a concern. And then lastly, just looking at undeveloped areas. Um, so we have a um, NLCD, National Land Cover Database, looking at imperviousness. And, um, and looking at the inverse of that, actually, to, to see you know, true wildland areas that are undeveloped and so that they're um, natural uh, and, and subject to potential invasion. So those are the eight criteria that we use. We kept it pretty simple. And um, what the results of this analysis are is um, we have an interactive web map um, that's available on the DSSM website. Um, available to the public. And, and we kept it nice and simple so that a, a high priority hexagon um, would have a, a score of up to one and, and be red, and a low priority would have a um, score close to zero and, and be a blue color. So a hot cold map. And um, you can also on the web map view each of the eight criteria individually, which is nice. So if you're really interested in, um, you know, the, the sensitive wildlife species, a protected species, you could just view that layer for the whole state on an hexagon um, basis. Some other features and products that are on the web map that I can share with you. You can customize the map um, a bit using the draw feature, so you could um, type in some information um, over the web map, um, highlight areas, draw a, um, a shape around an area that you're possibly working in or interested in. You can also print a map um, from the um, tool or make a PDF map to, to share. And then lastly, you can also view, um, we wrote a report, um, an 18 page report that goes over this analysis in much more detail. And that's available on our website. Unfortunately, you cannot currently download the GIS data. I just checked this morning and that, that link is broken. Um, so I need to follow up on that because we had a, I believe it was hosted on the AZGO site, and, and I'm just not up to speed on, on what's going on with that. But um, we do we did want to make this data um, available uh, to those that would like to use it. So just looking at some results, when you go to the web map, this is what you see um, zoomed out of Arizona. And on the right, you can see this is our hot cold um, priority map. So this is a master index from zero to one. And um, looking at the state, you know, you can see some priority areas in, around Tucson and um, Flagstaff, and um, and I'll show you some other areas in, in more detail. But this is where you begin, and then you can zoom in to your area of interest. So this is a high priority. Um, you can see that very dark red, the um, master index score. And this might be a little hard for you to see it. Um, but the master index score is 0 0.96. So that's about as high of a priority area as you can get. Um, what it shows below is, is some, but not all, of the sub indices scores. So, like the Easy Wrap Wildfire Risk Index is 0 0.73. And, and there's an on and on it goes into the scores. But this location is on the Verde River, um, right in Camp Verde, um, off of I 17. So, um, Riparian areas are often impacted by invasive species, and this tells us um, that you know this is an area where where some treatment is needed. And in fact, our one of our 2020 invasive plant grants is going to uh, occur right in this area, <laughs> so it marries up well with <laughs> the work that we're us and our partners are going to do um, to deal with invasive plants. Just a few other examples to show you. Um, this is an example on the Mogollon Rim. So a forested environment, and, and this is the Blue Ridge area. Um, I type that on there using the draw tool, but um, this is uh, basically north of Payson, uh, north of Pine and Strawberry. Um, 
in the in the Blue Ridge area, and you can see there's um you know some high priority area that falls within a developed um, community. There's some ranchette um, subdivisions um, in those three um, hexagons, and and uh, in fact they do have an invasive plant problem there that that I got to see over the summer. Um, and I looked at this tool before I went out there and, and recognized that this is indeed a high priority area um, per the <clears throat> per the analysis that we did. This is a, a wildland urban interface example um, from here in Phoenix where I'm located. Um, just to orient you a little bit, um, this location um, basically La Send it Send Us Golf Club is um, in the east side of Phoenix, um, East Mesa area, and, and they border the Tonto National Forest. Um, this is by Usury Mountain Park. Um, and you can again see a higher priority area um, as they border um, the Tonto National Forest and, and they've got an increased risk of, of uh, fire. Just a few more examples. This is a riparian area example um, from the Salt River. So you can see that riparian corridor comes up as higher priority. This is just southwest of Phoenix, um, the Gila River and the Salt River where, where they connect. Um, another riparian example, the lower Gila River over in Buckeye. Um, again, a narrow band along the Gila where there's a lot of invasive uh, salt feeder, and so it, it pops off the map as being a priority for, for treatment. And in fact, one of our uh, 2020 projects is um, in one of these polygons, one of the orange polygons this year. I just have a few more slides. I, I know I'm uh, kind of close on time. Um, just an overview of this tool, the advantages that, that I see, um, it, it identifies some hot spots around the state where uh, invasive species are um, you know, priority for treatment. And that can help direct our attention, direct our funding, direct our staff, just like it can with other individual agencies. And it can also be used to prioritize grant funding to high priority areas. And that's what we've done. We've asked our grant, invasive plant grant application to provide us a score. What's your IPTP score? Um, for your project area. Some disadvantages, it, it doesn't give you any treatment information or, or treatment recommendations for, for that particular polygon. It, it doesn't drill down to that level of detail yet. And it's missing information on like what specific invasive plants you might find in that hexagon. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, we could have um, to in further inform users. So what's next? Um, and this is going to take time, but we could develop a more localized planning tool, so drilling down a little further. We can add layers for invasive plant species of some of the greatest management concern in Arizona, like buffalo grass and salt cedar. Um, those are probably the two biggest. Those affect wildfire. Desert invaders like stink net, um, you see a flyer on your left. Um, so, and also incorporating information on, on some of these key components of, of management, prevention, early detection, having a rapid response and then eradication approaches for invasive plants. And then we can also, to this tool, add some administrative and natural resource boundaries, um, possibly a reporting feature um, so that you can select an area and, and get a report um, on, on what uh, the conditions are, what the, um, the prioritization is. So to, to wrap up, um, this analysis and the products certainly will help DFSM prioritize our, our program delivery. That's going to help me with where, you know, I should focus my time in technical assistance and where we should provide um, grant funding to uh, partners. And it can certainly also be used by any community in Arizona that, that's interested or concerned about invasive plants and their management needs because it's publicly available. Um, the analysis could also be used in grant proposals. So if you're writing a grant proposal, you know, tools like this are really helpful. You can say, I'm in a, I'm uh, proposing to do some work in a high priority area um, and, and I've got some need for treatment, you know, see this DSSM treatment score. Um, that's a good uh, use of this tool, I think, is for proposals and justification. Um, I want to acknowledge that this was prepared, this tool was, was built by um, Wolfgang Grunberg, our, our GIS coordinator, um, and John Richardson and Corey Dolan, who are um, in our forestry programs 
um, at, at DSSM. And I also just want to acknowledge that uh, major funding for um, de developing this tool and, and a lot of our forestry programs comes from the USDA Forest Service. And with that, 19 minutes from, looks like I'm done. Let's see, stop sharing. Hey, thank you very much, Willie. It's a great presentation. Thanks, Jeremy, Glenn. I think we have a minute or two if you want to try to look at the, the chat and see if there's any questions to address. Yeah, I can, I, I'll, I'll take care of the questions here, Willie, if you want to field them. Um, <clears throat> first, Wolfgang did mention that the, uh, the AZ Geo Hub wasn't updated, but it looks like the data has been updated now with the right location. Uh, we have a question from Eric said, you may have mentioned it, but how is the model determining if there is an invasive species in the hexagon more specifically without physically seeing the invasive species? Right. It's, it's based on um, some different data sets that we use. Um, like one is called SEI net. Um, for instance, there's some different, um, uh, hubs of, of invasive species um, sightings and and, um, and reports and, and maps, and so we access those databases where there are known infestations, and and um, that was one of our um, tools that we use, right, to verify that there's in fact invasive plants there. And question from Mark Cristiano: How did you determine the size of each hexagon? So we went about, you know, as small as you can go, you know, one one square mile um, in a hexagon, and so that's 600, you know, well, around 640 acres. Um, that was just determined to be a um, adequate unit unit of analysis for the for the tool. Um, you know, without going any further, you're getting into almost individual, you know, land ownership, and we wanted to be above that um, so that it was a general enough where um, we could drill deeper if, if need be. Okay. Uh, Yaching Lin asked, are there any plans to update the data in this map? Not at the moment. Um, you know, the, the tool is just two, two years old now, and um, we're, we're certainly looking for feedback on it and, and you know, I'd be happy to, if anyone takes a look and has ideas or suggestions, please, please reach out to me. But um, not, not at the moment. We're um, uh, letting it, you know, be utilized and, and see how it goes with, with folks. Okay. Danny Lawler asked, how would you gather information on specific invasive plants? So information, there are organizations that are, um, collaborative organizations that are working on mapping invasives where there's um, citizen scientists and volunteers that are um, utilizing the um, uh, mapping programs even on their smartphones to map the locations of invasive plants as they're out hiking and, and traveling across the you know, Phoenix and Tucson. So um, uh, CASCA, um, which I think we're going to hear from later, um, and Desert Defenders, um, they're a great organization that are, that are taking this on that are building maps of um, and, and helping people learn how to map invasive plants. Okay. Uh, Eric has a follow-up question. I was wondering if satellite bands could pick up certain species. From my observations, yes. Um, salt cedar, um, you know, uh, turns orange, you know, it, in the fall it, it, it loses its leaves and, and turns their orange color um, that can that can and has been picked up um, remote, remotely, and, and stink net is another invasive plant in the desert that's a new invader, and that does have a real distinct color um, to it when it's dried and browned out, or when it's yellow and in flower. So, yeah, those are some tools that that could be certainly used in the fight against these invasive plants. Kimberly Denny, Denny is wondering if you are utilizing lidar to extract this this analysis. Not that I'm aware of, not at the not at the moment. I'm sure other organizations or agencies may be working on that, you know, like the USGS or or others, but um, not us at the moment. No. Okay. Hey guys, Sorry. in the interest of time, to be fair to the yeah. other presenters, I think we should draw a line here somewhere. Willie, yeah. I don't know if you're willing to share an email address or something in chat, or if you're listening in, if you want to try to respond to some of the questions in the chat box while the other presentation is going on, that would. 
that makes sense. Great. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Thank man. you. It's a great. A uh, lot of interest in what you're doing. We appreciate it. Let me see if I can. Um, Get back to the next presentation. So, Chuck, you're on. I think. Are you going to be driving your presentation? Yes. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Just wanted to make sure. I'm going to switch over to Chuck Powell. He's with Westland, Westland Resources. The presentation is going to be on restoring culturally significant Emory Oak Groves in Arizona. Chuck, in the interest of time, I know you've changed some of your presenters. Could you just introduce your team real quickly for the group? Um, and I will let you know that uh, there are bios posted on the website if folks want to read the, the detailed bios. And I know you have a new member if they want to share the bio with us, we can make sure it gets posted also. Definitely. So today I have um, Don Rocha, um, let me get this correct, um, is, is a Wallapai from the Wallapai tribe of Peach Springs, Arizona. She represents the Yavapai Apache tribe when working with Western Resources. Um, she is a tribal monitor participating in the Tohono, or I'm sorry, Tonto. National Forest Tribal Monitoring Training Program and has been working for Westland for the last three years. Her position helps in many ways, giving an overview of how the native mind works without conducting land assessments. Her expertise is in tribal knowledge of plants. Um, I also have Stacey McClure hiding in the crowd uh, with me. Um, she helped put the presentation together. She's an environmental specialist here at Westland. Um, specializing in restoration projects, and myself, um, a GIS specialist at Western for too many years. Um, um, the lead um, UAS, uh, sometimes Crasher, the lead pilot here at Western, and um, I also do some geo marketing at a few schools here in Tucson. So let's go ahead and dive into the presentation. Let me share my screen. Can you guys see my screen? No, we can't yet. How about right. right there? Okay. Doug, you want to take it over? Just make sure you're unmuted. Okay. My name is Don Rocha. Like um, Chuck had uh, introduced me, I am Wallapai. Uh, today we're, we're, we're going to be talking about restoring cultural significant emerald groves in Arizona. This was uh, presented to our Tonto National um, liaison, uh, Loni, Noni um, Nanaba Landon. Uh, so um, the Tonto, no, Tonto and Coconino National Forest with the funding from Resolution Copper uh, Mine. I recently began the Emory Oak Collaboration Restoration Incentive, the EOCTRI, um, is to restore and protect the Emory Oak groves to ensure just the sensibility of the substance food for Arizona tribes. Uh, the emery oak is a cultural significant tree for native people and has been used for manalia for its uh, nutritious uh, mass, the, um, the acorn harvest. The emery oak is an important substance base for the Apache and uh, Yavapai people and has spiritual cultural significance. Each um, September, October is the time we emery oak. It is actually a food that we eat all the time. We collect, we store, we eat. 
throughout the winter um, in our use of in our um, ceremonies to feed other, other people. The intent of this project is to improve the long-term health and vigor of the uh, oak groves and begin to lay the foundation for tracking and restoring the significant food source for Arizona tribe. Um, through EOCTRI, several significant emery oak groves have been selected for research and treatment. Baseline data is co being collected at each site and will be followed by treatment, which may include removing um, non-desirable competing vegetation, restore, reintroducing fire through broadcast during burning, and they're fencing off areas to protect and increase seedling establishment, establishment from cattle grazing and restaurant impacts. <clears throat> the emery oak are very significant to the Apaches and other tribes. For this, um, for the elders to see that uh, they took, uh, Revolution took the initiative to help us restore these um, these oak groves is very important to us and we, we do appreciate it because um, we want to know how long it'll take to grow once happening and it, you know the data collection out there we would like to see how far it goes and if we could restore the, the oak groves. To date, 14 emery oak grove sites throughout Arizona have been selected for study and treatment. The baseline data is being collected by teams of Westland biologists and travel monitors participating in the Tonto National Forest Travel Monitor Training Program. This program was in initially designed to incorporate Native American travel perspectives into environmental reviews and decision making process to identify special uh, places of culture and significance using traditional ecological knowledge and to provide represent, representatives of several Native American tribes, communities with training in modern cultural biological resource survey methods. Um, right here, we have uh, one of the tribal monitors doing um, the Soil surveying, he's doing right here. He's looking at um, the length of the the ground up to see how big the the um, the base are from the ground. It says both ground and aerial data is being collected at the significant Oak Grove sites. Initial work began in the fall of 2019 and the summer of 2020. During the time of the selected Oak Grove sites were grounded, truth and studied plot sites were established. Ground data collect collected at the time included categorizing plots assigning identifying um, identification numbers to emery oaks for long-term tracking inventory of species, wood density, and soil data, and eco-locating flowering oaks for harvesting in the fall of 20 will be begin collecting aerial data for long-term monitoring of these oak groves. Thanks, Don. Um, You're welcome. Um, so now, um, uh, in 2020 and uh, in the next couple of months, uh, we're going to be flying uh, our drone, um, collecting a um, large amount of spectral data that can be correlated with some of the ground data. Um, so um, let me dive right into this. Um, this story map will be shared to the group. Um, and there's a couple of videos in here that are worth watching, especially the first one. 
um, uh, with uh, some of the tribe members um, talking about how important the emery oaks are to them. So we're flying our, our fixed wing um, um, drone, um, UAS, um, with a multi-spectral. Uh, so we're able to collect a large amount of data um, very quickly. Um, so with each photo it takes, it, it's actually taken five individual images, um, red, green, near infrared, and red edge as individual bands. Um, it does not collect an individual blue band. Um, that's the least helpful band um, when you're looking at vegetation. Um, so, and then it has a, a, a lesser quality RGB where we can do some overall photos uh, or colorization of, of uh, points. Um, the other nice factor in this sensor, it has a sunshine sensor. Um, so it's recording how much light it's taking in and it, it can, it can standardize over years. So we can, we can look at, uh, flights from multiple years. And, and be looking at constant data. So that's a really nice feature on uh, this sensor. Um, so just a quick quick thing on multi-spectral indices. Um, we're actually looking at just what is what is the plant, what is the tree um, reflecting? Um, usually when it's a healthier plant, the red edge and the near infrared is um, going to be uh, much higher. Uh, much brighter um, in the photo than uh, a less healthy um, plant or, or leaf. Uh, one of the more common indices um, we look at is uh, NDVI, uh, Normalized Difference of Vegetation Index. Um, it looks at plant vigor, so it's taking the near infrared and red band and comparing it. Uh, and, uh, it's, it's, it's really huge in the agricultural um, business. It's one of the standard ones we look in, um, in uh, uh, natural resources as well. Um, another one is NDRE. Um, it is, it's looking at chlorophyll content. Um, this one is um, very nice when um, we're looking at very dense vegetation. Uh, so this one helps us identify healthy plants um, during that time. Um, chlorophyll, um, just looking at stress and, and, and uh, with this being a long-term project of 50 years, um, um, we want to look at trends, um, so looking at stress, um, those kind of factors in, in the oaks um, might be able to forecast um, things uh, and, and look at different um, results. Um, color infrared is just a nice um, visual graphic as a lot of people are very visual uh, people. So having an image that can pop vegetation where we can make all the vegetation look red, um, it, it's just a nice way to um, um, display data. A few other indices we can look at, um, if anyone has any questions about these and what circumstances we use those, uh, feel free to ask a question or we can, you can email me. Um, what I'm more excited about is some of the new tools out there to be able to share this data. You know, these are large data sets. Like I said, it takes five photos um, per image. Um, and um, usually I'm in the uh, over a thousand waypoints when I'm taking these. So, you know, we're looking at 5,000 images and, and uh, hundreds of megs of ortho mosaics when we stitch them all together. This is a, a, a tool we use that it gives the end user ability to work with the data without having the GIS software. So they can come in here, look at the NDVI, change the colors to suit what they need to also play with. They just want to see just that special.
special band, they can come in here and, and zoom into the area of interest and, and start analyzing itself. Um, also, uh, be able to track back in time. And like I said, this is a, a, a long-term project of 50 years um, that um, we're going to have a large amount of data and having these cloud-based tools are going to be very useful for all the team members um, looking at this data and, and figuring out what data um, they want to use for their analysis. Um, the other data we're getting um, also on this is um, 3D data. So when we take these images, stitch them together, it actually creates a 3D model that you can come in and look at. So you can rotate it, um, zoom in, and um, do what, you know, look at it, print it out, export it. I'm going to quickly make a generating uh, elevation profile of a line. You can draw a line anywhere, and it will give you an elevation um, profile of it on the spot. Uh, able to download it, all the data, export it, and um, be able to use it in your own analysis. So you can come in here, and you can follow that, that line. Let's get to here. So you can see it on the image. So um, we'll be able to track. Um, the canopy height. Um, this is not LIDAR, so we're not penetrating the canopy. We're just in the top of the canopy, um, but we're going to be able to track heights over the years. Um, here is taking those 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 pixels, um, which the software turns into point um, point clouds like like LIDAR, LAS point set. Um, and we can actually do cross sections, do analysis. Um, this is a, a quick um, cross section we did um, near Superior um, outside of this project, um, but we'll be able to track um, year after year um, the the cross sections, the canopy heights, and 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 track the growth that way as well. So. Like, like uh, Don said, is um, this is a, a, a great project, um, and I'm just a small part of it. Um, but I think the aerial data collection will aid in the long-term study of these oak groves and, um, and, and, and help um, um, restore these and manage these groves. I'm going to leave you with this quote uh, by Apache Elder. Bay Cameron's eagles and others are an indication of environmental health to the Apache people. Uh, Chichil, um, acorns are the single most important traditional food today, and they are vital to almost every Apache social and ceremonial function. So with that, uh, our presentation is up. Thank you, guys. Yeah, there's a, we got a question from Mark Cristiano. He's wondering what program was used to create the 3D model? Um, we use um, Pix4D. Um, it's a typical uh, structure for motion um, software. Um, it's one of the industry standards for UAS programs. Um, okay. And then um, the microsense is an add-on function um, to be able to share the uh, multi-spectral imagery. Got it. Thank you. Uh, that's all that's in the chat for right now. Okay. Thank you very much, guys. That was a great presentation. We're going to go ahead and try to move on to Ariana. Just have to check something here real quick. Uh, all right. I'm going to turn over the presentation to Ariana Rashke. Uh, she's with the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance, and she's going to be talking to us about green print, protect, and connect. Central Arizona Conservation Alliance geospatial tool. Ariana is uh, CASA's program director, and she leads the CASA effort to facilitate collaboration among the alliance partners, as well as implementation of the ROS. 
She comes from an interdisciplinary research background as a political ecologist, studying uh, community-based conservation and ecotourism as a biodiversity preservation tool. So that said, Ariana, uh, looks like we can see your presentation. So I'm gonna go ahead and let you take it away. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. And thanks for the very nice introduction. I'm gonna try to move quickly to hopefully leave a couple minutes for questions if anyone has them. Um, I just wanna preface this presentation by saying that CASCA does do little trainings and workshops on this tool. So if anyone's interested in exploring it in more depth, uh, we'd be happy to do that over Zoom or in person whenever it's safe to do that again. Um, and I believe if the, if AJIC doesn't share this PowerPoint, I'd be happy to share it with anyone interested. There is a section at the end, which I will not go over today, that includes a little walkthrough again for anyone who's interested. Um, so just to give some project context on CASCA and this tool, because I think it will be helpful in understanding if it might be helpful for the work that you're doing or not. Uh, CASCA does focus on Maricopa County just due to the capacity that we have. Currently, we only have two people on staff, uh, but we are we support a network, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. But um, so we focus on Maricopa County, which you can see outlined here in black. Uh, but the tool, the green print tool, includes a bit of a larger area based on sort of including different Huck 10 watersheds to make it more ecologically cohesive. Um, so this map is a good indication of whether or not the green print might be helpful for you, depending on where your focus and your work is. Um, if I had had more time, I would have waxed poetic about the biodiversity of the Sonoran Desert, but you guys all know why we wanna work in this landscape and save it. One of the impetus for CASCA as well as the green print is, you know, one of the unique challenges that we face here in Maricopa County is the rapid pace of development. Uh, we are and have been the fastest growing county for a while. So, um, you know, the idea behind CASCA was to try to help address this by teaming up and collaborating with various different organizations um, government, nonprofit, uh, grassroots, et cetera, in our region to kind of focus on how do we make a regional open space network that can serve this growing community that we have here and that can also provide space for our biodiversity, um, you know, including plants and animals. So what is the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance? Like I said, we are a network. So if your organization is interested in getting involved with something like this, we'd be happy to talk more. Just for the sake of time, I won't go into a lot of detail, but we, uh, we run a, ver a variety of programs, including networking opportunities, but also things like the green print. We wanna provide tools for our partners to go out there and do conservation work and serve the community here. Um, and so these are just some of the partners we have. We actually have about 60 different partner organizations. So as you can imagine, this is only a snapshot. And the purpose of these logos is kind of to give you guys an idea of the different kinds of organizations that are involved because there's a lot of different um, players at the table and that's what we want. Um, so the Ross was mentioned, that's the regional open space strategy for Maricopa County. That's kind of our guiding star and that comes from our partners. Uh, essentially, we asked if we want to provide a regional network of open spaces, natural open spaces, how do we do that? Um, and you can see here, there were four primary goals that were identified by the partners as being essential to us being able to do that. And by us, I mean our partnership, because obviously uh, two people at CASCA can't do that alone. Um, the first one, Protect and Connect, uh, really informs the green print. Um, we believe that in order to plan for this network and care for the land that's already sort of set aside, uh, we do need to have some kind of tool to view what's going on in regards to the ecosystems here 
Um, and also what are sort of the um, conditions being faced in the community? For example, heat vulnerability is a very big deal, obviously in, in Maricopa County for people living here and natural spaces can help mitigate that. So looking and diving into the green print a little bit more, I like to talk about what some of our primary goals were with the tool. If you are able to check it out, you will see that we have um, context layers, which are just pure data from our partners. They're all very interesting, uh, but we also have some analysis layers that were identified by the partners again as being important. And there was kind of a process involved in producing these. So for those of you that might wanna use this data, I just like to talk about how we went through that process and what we did. So you have an understanding of where the data comes from and what it might be useful for uh, or otherwise. So the three primary things that we believed were important to that protect and connect and building that network of open spaces was ensuring habitat integrity, protecting water resources, and mitigating heat risk through those nature-based solutions, as I kind of mentioned before. So these are three primary analysis layers, although, like I said, there's actually quite a lot of data in this tool from a variety of different places um, that span a pretty big um, variety of data. What I'm saying is there's a lot of different things to look at. Um, but these analysis layers did come from a process, so I do like to discuss them. So essentially, in order to produce these three layers, which brought together a lot of data, there was an iterative process of collecting information from a variety of partners, modeling, uh, bringing together some of that data and synthesizing it, and getting feedback from experts on whether or not this was truly representative of what was going on on the ground. And then as you can see here, those models were refined over time based on that feedback to make sure that as data is being synthesized, it is really representing what our experts know is relevant. So looking at some of the data that went into each of the analysis layers, you can see here, um, there's a variety of different possibilities for each. So protecting water resources, potentially looking at headwaters, perennial streams, et cetera, and um, the same for the other two. And part of what the advisory committee helped do was to discuss what sort of weight there might be to each of these data sources for the analysis layer. So when they were synthesized, how much importance would they have for the final product? Um, so just as a brief look at what these kind of look like, obviously from that analysis and uh, stakeholder interaction that I discussed earlier, what uh, priorities would be assigned. Um, that is of course not strange for a GIS analysis. So I'm sure you're all familiar with maps similar to these. And just at a brief, this is what the final product looked like and what you can explore in the green print if you're interested. So this one is that habitat integrity analysis layer, our protecting water resources layer. And this is a close up of the mitigating heat risk. So this one, this layer specifically does not include that entire area that I showed you earlier. And that kind of appears in these other images because it's focused specifically on the city, but you can actually go in and explore uh, by, by parcel quite closely if you're interested in what's going on in the city. Um, so besides those things, the green print does have a variety of other tools. One of the things that we look at is park access. So I mentioned natural open spaces. Um, a lot of times those here in Phoenix might be our mountain parks. Um, so we do believe that park access is very important to what we're trying to do and also important to a lot of our partners. So we have a few different things included in the green print, including a layer like this where you can just view uh, if there is you know, a huge need as in these red areas, um, but you can also draw parks and get a, an analysis on who, if that park existed, could access the park, what the demographics would look like, um, and that kind of thing. So 
There are a lot of interactive elements to the tool besides just the analysis layers that I discussed, um, including the park access. We also have a way to search um, data tag parcels. If you are interested in potentially obtaining land, you can actually put in different criteria to search for those parcels within Maricopa County. Um, so I'm actually gonna leave it there, except to say that if you are interested in checking out the green print on your own, uh, this would be the web page to look at here. Um, and in terms of looking at the metadata, you would find that here in the data description. Um, it does look like this and you can freely scroll through and look at all the different kinds of data that's available, where it came from, how old it is. And then if you wanna access the, yes, I will, I see that comment. I'll paste the URL to the chat. Um, and then if you want to access the mapping portal itself, which is what I was discussing, um, you can do so. The only thing, it is free, but it will ask you to make an account um, and you'll just need to verify your email. Other than that, you should then be let into the tool to explore freely. And as I mentioned, we do uh, little workshops if people are interested in walking through or if you work with people that you think might uh, get use out of this tool, but maybe they're a little less familiar with the GIS interface, uh, we'd be happy to help out with that. So I'll also share my email in the chat for anyone interested in learning more and possibly, um, you know, either doing a workshop or I'm happy to answer questions as well. So, Ariana, this is Glenn. Uh, I think the good news is, first of all, that was a great presentation. We're uh, we're heading into a break, so there isn't another session coming up right away. So, if, uh, if folks are wanting to stay on and answer <coughs> questions of you or any of the other presenters, I'm going to stay on for a little bit longer. Uh, there is a, a sponsor breakout session immediately after this. So if you want to talk to some of the sponsors, I encourage you to do that for a virtual networking session uh, after that, prior to our other special interest group meeting. Um, Jeremy, are there other questions in the box for Ariana? Uh, Willie Somers is asking, is there a standard unit of analysis for the green print tool? Um, that's a great question, Willie. So I would say, no, uh, in that each of the context layers, if you were to view them, do come from different data sources, but the metadata itself should discuss exactly what that is, as well as the tool itself will give some context. Um, if I had a little more time, I could have shown that there are elements of each layer that can be clicked on, and then there's data pertaining to individual elements of each layer. And then for the analysis layers themselves, that gets a little more complicated due to that synthesis. So if someone were interested in learning more, we would probably reach out to uh, TPL to ask them exactly for what kind of modeling equations they did so you could really delve into what the, what the analysis looked like. Um, it looks like, um, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to butcher this, but Mela Konea is asking, are you working directly with City of Scottsdale as well as McDowell Center Conservancy? Um, so our primary partner is McDowell Center Conservancy. We've worked with the City of Scottsdale on some specific projects, like we recently finished um, a State of the Parks initiative where we were looking at funding for parks. And at that point, we did connect with the city. Um, that being said, we're always open to new partners. So, you know, if the city of Scottsdale was interested, we definitely would be interested. And, you know, when projects emerge that they would like to be at the table for, we're, we're always open to work with, with anyone. Thank you. Uh, Vivian is asking, how do you measure transient popul population access to parks as a heat mitigation strategy? Um, you know, I don't think that's specifically something that's included. Um, when you look at the data, I do think that that access to parks is primarily for the, the local communities, you know, that may be renters or homeowners. I don't know in terms of the transient population. Although I guess I'd be interested to know if, if you mean transient in terms of 
seasonal where we obviously we have people that do move in just for the winter or if you mean perhaps homeless population not sure okay people experiencing homelessness in our communities so i don't think that our tool would have necessarily a good indication of that um but that's something that we'd be happy to discuss if you have any insight into that um, because i do think that's obviously very important um not only to to us and our partners but to those those people experiencing that um, thanks thank you that's all for questions thank you for sharing your email and web address i appreciate it yeah I'm happy to thank you so much everyone yeah thank you again thank i you. want to thank all the presenters uh for those of you that are still on i would encourage everyone to fill out the survey for the session give us some feedback obviously this virtual Format is new for all of us, and we're trying to learn as much as we can. Make improvements. Forbid if we have to do this again next year. <laughs> Thank you again, everyone.